and we're live. Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of Psychics, where we know the hits in science. My name is Daniel. My name is Abdullahi. I'm Brian. And my name is Alex, and I just want to give a shout out to my girlfriend, Elisa, for making the logo. We're four biology students at the University of Waterloo that have a desire to explain and examine all the cool aspects of science that we see in the news. Brian, do you want to start us? Sure. So today we have an article on toxoplasmosis. And what toxoplasmosis is, it's a disease caused by a single-celled eukaryote, Toxoplasmosa gondii, which is commonly found inside of cats. And the disease is typically called cat scratch fever because at initial presentation or the acute signs are normally just cold-like symptoms, possibly fever, just very minor. You can brush it off. But chronic can cause cysts inside the brain, which lead to neuroinflammation, which causes severe, more neurological symptoms such as schizophrenia, mania, bipolarism, etc. And this disease can be possibly passed through cats in the fecal cycle, where, for example, if a cat defecates and when you're cleaning a litter box, you can possibly get exposure. And if by just chance it gets in your mouth, then you might get the disease. And it has infected one third of the world, and it is very common. And what the article is on is about a new drug called guanabens, which could possibly lead to reduction in cystload with, within the brain to reduce the neurological symptoms and could possibly lead to a cure to toxoplasmosis. So the guanabens was injected and also given or administered orally to the mice and reduction in cyst loads were observed in some mice, but in other mice, there was also no reduction in cyst load, but it also did reduce different symptoms, which could have led or which led to reduced hyperactivity within the mice. So when it comes to guanabens, one of the first questions is how could it reduce hyperactivity inside of the cells. So guanabens first off is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist and what an agonist is is it's a type of drug which binds to a receptor and elicits the same effect without actually being the molecule that's supposed to bind to it. Yeah so like adding on to that what what the what do you think of an agonist does is that it um it basically allows well, yeah, so a agonist by definition stops something from happening. So a adrenergic agonist would stop something known as adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase, what it does, it converts ATP to AMP. And converting ATP to AMP would, would uh, generally lower energy because you're taking away ATP, which is the kind of energy currency of, of cells. So by blocking alpha-2 alpha adrenergic receptors, you are resulting actually in less ATP, so less energy. And that's how you re how you reduce the hypertension and the general hyperactivity that can cause neuroinflammation in uh, Toxoplasma gondii infected hosts. Not for me, it's just always whenever it comes to these kind of studies, I always wonder how can we honestly tell perfectly whether this works for humans or not? Because we always have to start with the mice or the rats and to see if it works properly on them. And of course, it does reduce symptoms, but it's some strains of the mice, it reduced the cyst load, but in others, it didn't reduce cyst loads, but they both reduced hyperactivity. How can we even tell for sure if it would work on humans? Yeah, that's, that's a big, uh, like, that's a big point because the human anatomy and mice and, and, the, and the mouse anatomy, sorry, is quite different. So we might have different responses based on our Im immune systems to guanabens, as well as uh, Toxoplasma gondii itself, the parasites. So, uh, sorry. I've always been wondering because if any of you own cats, because I know I do, just how do you feel about it? Honestly, um, I am a cat owner here. Honestly, it's it's weird to think about because like I look at like my animal, my cat, and I'm just like, yeah, it's you know the cutest thing ever. But like, just the fact is, like a third of the world's population has this like parasite essentially and like it could affect you like mentally and like neurologically and it's just like you know what if my cat what if i have this parasite in me like you know there's almost like no way of knowing unless you get the chronic version of the disease or like if you you know get some sort of test done but it's just crazy to think like you know my cat could possibly be harboring this parasite and be transporting it to me and my family members and even other people which is like that's crazy to think about honestly 
But I feel at least to me that I wouldn't worry about it too much because I've owned cats my whole life. I've had like over 10, love them all, but I probably have a very high chance of getting exposed to this. And some, and if one third of the population is affected, is it really that big of a problem? Because yes, it causes these horrible neurological symptoms, but if one third is affected, shouldn't it be showing a lot more signs or shouldn't it be showing more prevalence? Because if it just exposes itself as just minor cold, then maybe we only have to test if someone has a neurologic condition, whether it's toxoplasmosis or something else, because those are the hardest to pinpoint. Yeah, that's actually something I was going to bring up is that I think the real danger with toxoplasmosis is not the fact that um, it causes neurological diseases, albeit those are very debilitating and very scary disorders themselves. The main problem is the acute symptoms that you mentioned before, Brian. As as much as the fact that those are quite harmless and um, flu-like symptoms for those who have a strong immune system, for people who are, who are Im immunocompromised, there are two problems that come with toxoplasmosis infection. The first of which is those, those acute symptoms, while being harmless for people with a strong immune system, can be deadly for those with an immunocompromised system. For example, they might already be infected with a flu or with um, pneumonia, for example. As well, you were speaking of cysts before. So, the article spoke of the way that um, Toxoplasma gondii actually infects their hosts is by using cysts called tachyozytes and having those, those tachyozyte cysts converting into bradyozytes. Then the problem is those bradyozytes, which then cause the chronic toxoplasmosis, may switch back to tachyozytes. Once they switch back to tachyozytes, you have all those acute symptoms come back again. And that can be very deadly for someone with a immunocompromised system because they can, un they can unknowingly have all of those acute symptoms, which can lead to fatality. Yeah, but I feel there's always been lots of studies when it comes to the effect of toxoplasmosis on the brain. There's been many, there's, or there's been a lot of research on what it does to mice and rats, where it's been found, I think a few studies have discovered that, that infections with toxoplasmosis in rats cause them to have less developed i think it's amygdala the fear center of the brain mm -hmm. so that makes them approach cats more which lets them get eaten so the toxoplasmosis can reproduce if the rat that had it is eaten of course so i'm not sure about how severe the actual diseases or how well it can infect an immunocompromised person of course if their immune system is completely destroyed then it can do a lot of harm. Yeah, that's if you're true. at that point, you're usually in the hospital and you're not exposed to anything. So I don't feel as though it's that big of a threat, but I still think it is good to have a vaccine against it because if it does reduce neurological symptoms, then if someone has these kind of symptoms, they could help possibly, but we can never tell because the brain is complicated. No, yeah, that's very true. And actually, that's something that um, that's something that you mentioned before, I believe, with the with the uh, with the felines and and mice that that are infected with toxoplasmosis. Sorry, with toxoplasma gondii, the mice that that are infected being eaten by the uh, cats and then being kind of in a almost um, how do you say almost like they're they're, they're in a docile or oh, yeah a, exactly so so a, a um docile or kind of almost um ready to be eaten uh like a mode that that seems like kind of a evolutionary trait of the to toxoplasma gondii right that it, it kind of the way that it can spread from infected host to uh, sorry the, the way that it can infect from host to host and spread from host to host is through um almost uh taking over the mind of of the of the host that infects and making it susceptible to be eaten by another host that's transferring it so very cool fact indeed um abdullah just one one quick question um what are your thoughts on this and uh why really um is the like do uh you think that there's other ways of, of toxoplasma gandhi to actually infect hosts or is it just through cats your mic's muted yeah here let me just un uh yeah there you go so I was, it's quite interesting because uh toxoplasmosis is actually the most common parasite in the world and it just it's not its origin is just not from cat feces it can also occur from like uh you know infection from pregnant women so like when the child is yeah. born it could also be gone from there even from uncontaminated uh, food so <clears throat> 
it's a very interesting uh, parasite, and it seems very uh, uh, something we should not only do we have to think about. I wouldn't worry about it because, uh, first of all, I don't own cats, but I know that there's other ways. Like if I don't cook food properly, then I'm at risk. Uh, so I think that uh, in terms of the plasmosis itself, I think we're not paying enough attention to it as much as we should. And we shouldn't be only thinking about it because we get it from cats, because that's what all I've been talking about today. But I feel like uh, it's not getting enough attention that it deserves because it is a serious thing. And a third of the population of the world actually um, suffers from this because, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world. That's like, what, 2 point something billion people have this. Yeah. So, um, there's, there's just many, many ways to get this, not just through cat, um, cat fetus. So uh, if I were, I mean, I would be scared for, for this kind of, uh, parasite, uh, and think about many other ways to prevent it because uh, it, it, it doesn't happen from one origin. Yeah, and actually, I think a a, um, a big problem is that the actual toxoplasmosis disease is chronic. So um, cr- chronic in that it is, how do you say, um, permanent, yes. Because of the fact that, remember how I was speaking before of those tachyozites, those tachyozite cysts that then become bradyozites, once they become bradyocytes, the toxoplasmosis infection is is uh, is is now permanent, as in the neur- neuroinflammation will always occur in that infected host. So they're essentially trapped in whatever neurological disorder they uh, conceive, which is a very scary reality for a lot of people in the world. And um, something I also found that's kind of scary is that um, speaking here, that all all four of us are students at the University of Waterloo, so we're in Canada is that uh, guanabens is actually not being produced in Canada because the active pharmaceutical ingredient guanabens, 1,3-dichlorobenzene, is identified as toxic. Yeah, a lot of drugs obviously have these kind of side effects, and it's about weighing the risks of taking the drug versus weighing the benefits of killing the disease, possibly if under the assumption that the disease actually kills. But like all the toxoplasmosis brings me to like one of the old quote i forget who said it but a good virus does not kill its host Mm -hmm. and just like toxoplasmosis it doesn't directly kill anybody or it doesn't cause severe harm obviously it wouldn't kill you or me it causes the death of something like the rats possibly but that's also to make it reproduce so it doesn't directly kill it i feel like it's just as you said earlier daniel how it's evolutionary evolutionarily one of the smartest parasites if it made it to one third of the world it feels pretty incredible that something that small can be that hard to catch or hard to kill. But by using this drug, I feel like it could do good. But if it's known to be toxic, I feel like it doesn't just seem like there's enough people out there with the side effects or with the neurological symptoms that it's very worth using it. Maybe if it's some people are confirmed to have like a very chronic, very severe toxoplasmosis infection then maybe the drug might help but if it's a carcinogen or if it's some sort of it causes i don't know renal failure liver failure liver failure liver damage then it might not be worth it yeah like just to put my own uh, two cents in i really think this is an amazing achievement for biochemistry um in actual in actually looking at the um of the two adrenergic receptor and all the biochemical aspects of this drug as well as microbiology to fight parasites such as toxoplasma gondii and um, i think this actually reinforces the idea that science and society are are and always will be intertwined that anything that will affect us we can study through science such as toxoplasma gondii parasites or even um, for example just diseases that are genetics such as cancers that we have to always remember that science is on our side and um, that we should always uh, keep learning. And it's really a, 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 a it's, it's almost like a miracle now with one events that before we could have people with neurological diseases that are, that, that would go unexplained and it would almost be futile to actually treat people with these neurological diseases. However, now with one events, um, we can actually see that once the tachyozytes cysts become bradyozytes, we can effectively stop, um, the uh, toxoplasmosis from becoming chronic and then developing. And actually, to add, one, one thing that guanabens cannot do is, is stop the, the tachyzite cysts from forming in the first place. And because remember, it's those tachyzite cysts that make the neuroinflammation. 
So that's one area of potent research now is to see how can we even stop the Toxoplasma gondii from infecting the host to begin with. Yeah. I, like, I think one thing that I think that was really like kind of thinking about just now is like how we're kind of backtracking to what I think Brian was saying, like with the one third population with cats, how it's interesting how um, from an evolutionary standpoint, how uh, the parasite only really sexually reproduces in cats, but obviously it can like spread on into you know, humans and rats and whatnot. But it's interesting how like, I'm wondering, because I, I tried to look into this and I'm actually not sure myself, but like what sort of, um, like I guess what physiological difference between like, let's say like the cats, like tigers, which actually can uh, sexually reproduce in, you know, tigers or leopards or lynxes even, what kind of like physiological differences you know, those animals hold as opposed to like, let's say like rodents, like why, while sure the cysts and, you know, um, Toxoplasmosa gondii can um, asexually reproduce in those animals, what like, what difference is created because of, you know, the cats or like that family of, you know, tigers and whatnot, like what kind of yeah. sets that apart, you know? Yeah, that yeah. Poss- that's one of the possible ways that could lead to one of, or a vaccine or a cure to the disease, but I know it, it is a very good achievement if we could figure a vaccine out because normally when it comes to fighting microorganisms or these kind of, or yeah, microorganisms, then the more similar they are to our types of cells or if they're eukaryotic, the harder they usually are to fight off because finding drugs that kill bacteria, not us, it was difficult, but it got a lot or it got much easier because we're able to target things they do that we can't. But the closer they are to us, the harder it is because we have a very good chance of hurting ourselves in the process. Yeah. I think it's not even that like they're like, like it's definitely that they're similar, but I I also think it's that like parasites also like infect extracellularly. So unlike, you know, bacteria, which like would infect whether extracellularly or intracellularly can like, they kind of just hang around um, outside cells. Like they don't really necessarily infect inside. And I think like, I think I think this was actually in um, in one of our classes. I think we learned uh, physiology, where it's just like because it is extracellular and because it is like a much bigger, um, not a cell, but a much bigger like um, like oh shit, I'm, I'm, I can't think of the word, but like it's basically like an not an animal, but like a thing or like a parasite because it's bigger than like let's say like our immune system and the cells that deal with things like bacteria and viruses. Um, it has a much harder time like kind of dealing with that also I think that's also part to play in that as well yeah so uh, Brian do you want to conclude for us sure so overall we possibly have found one of the first treatments for toxoplasmosis which as we described earlier is one of the most widely distributed diseases infecting approximately one-third of the population and guanabens can possibly cure it by reducing neuroinflammation and reducing cyst load, but there needs to be a lot more research into it because there is varying results in the different types of mice they used and how it reduced cyst load, but they did have promising results in the fact that hyperactivity was reduced in almost. We try and figure out this cure, we might be able to finally stop this disease and if we're lucky, we might be able to even cure some of the neurological ailments some people face due to the disease if it's caused by it. Yeah, so I think uh, that's it for uh, today. So thank you everyone for joining us and be sure to catch our episode next week on a deadly form of tuberculosis in Southeast Asia and a vaccine that's now emerging to treat that. Thanks guys and see you next week.